So the module is called Sharing and Scaling at VM. Uh, if yesterday we learned how to uh, start a virtual machine and how to install Docker engine and pull a Docker container that has some bioinformatics tools, download data and uh, run a short uh, analysis on that data. Uh, today we are going to learn how to scale this entire process uh, for, for uh, multiple samples and uh, different options of how you be more productive uh, with your time and with the resources that you have available. Um, so we'll focus mostly on uh, freezing or snapshotting a virtual machine that you customize, um, how to share that uh, snapshot with um, other uh, cloud uh, projects in the same environment. Okay? So not your colleagues that see your VMs, but uh, other projects that have um, accounts in collaboratory or if you are going to do this kind of work in another cloud environment based on OpenStack, it's the same methodology. Uh, and how to launch uh, a virtual machine from a VM that was shared with you or from a snapshot that you took yourself. Okay? So you start the virtual machine, customize it, do some work, take a snapshot, and then two months later you want to start from the same point in time. You have that saved work and uh, it's easier to continue your, your research. And the uh, last point, how to scale your uh, VM uh, fleet to, to more than one and how to be more productive. Uh, let's discuss about what a snapshot is and uh, some of the uh, things to consider in taking a snapshot. So uh, when you take a snapshot, uh, basically you capture the state of the disk of the virtual machine at that moment. And uh, that uh, image is then uploaded into a central repository. Okay. So in cloud environments, um, there is a central repository where the base images uh, are stored. So when you uh, start a virtual machine, uh, there is a scheduler that decides based on available resources in the physical environment where your virtual machine is going to be scheduled to run. Okay? So if you have 30 physical servers with 256 gigs of RAM and 40 CPUs, and you want maybe a VM that has eight cores, the cloud scheduler is going to look at your compute nodes, how much resources they have available, it's going to filter them, it's going to sort them, and it's going to decide, okay, I'm going to start this VM on compute number 14. Okay? But compute number 14 doesn't have locally stored the image that you want to use for your VM. Okay? Because maybe it never ran there, or maybe it ran there, but uh, if it's not in use after a while, it gets deleted, so it doesn't cache continuously. So it has to download this image from this central repository, over there before it can start the virtual machine based on it. Okay? And uh, knowing how it works, it helps you decide um, how much data you want to put on your uh, image, on your instance, before you snapshot it. Because the more data you store there before you snapshot it, the longer it's going to take to start instances based on it later on. And also, you might be charged for uh, larger snapshots. Okay, because the cloud has to store your snapshot. If it's larger, it's going to take more space. Space means more hard drives, which cost more. So if you <coughs> do this uh, exercise, for example, in Amazon, Amazon charges like 10 cents per uh, gigabyte per month. Okay? If you snapshot um, a VM that has 300 gigabytes of data on it, okay, and you keep it for three months, it's going to cost you a few hundred dollars uh, or less. Um, if you uh, do some planning before take the snapshot, say, okay, I don't need to have actually this data in there. Okay, uh, Maybe I keep the data separate from <coughs> the binaries and from my uh, application. Okay, Then my snapshot is going to be smaller. I'm going to start my virtual machines faster from it, and it's going to cost me less. So important um, considerations. Another important thing is that uh, if you start an instance and you, uh, let's say, attach a volume to it, okay? I remember I told you yesterday about creating volumes that allow you to expand your uh, disk storage to more than what is provided in the VM, okay? 
Uh, so you uh, start the instance, create a volume, attach it. Maybe you can do this in the lab if we have time. And then you take a, a snapshot. The volume is not part of the snapshot. Okay. The volume is something that is attached uh, to the instance. And the, when you capture the instance, you don't capture what is attached to it externally, like the volume. So it's good to know that if you uh, put important data there and take a snapshot, expect it to be there next time you start an instance from the snapshot. You'll be surprised it's not there. Okay? Uh, so anything that you want to be in the instance, <coughs> install or any applications in the root disk, which is normal by uh, in the Linux distributions. Uh, we'll talk about some considerations. Uh, some of them I already uh, told you about, like uh, size, but there are others that are important. So uh, before hitting the snapshot button, it's important to do some uh, cleaning up and to, 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 to know how the system works and the uh, impacts of your decisions. So let's uh, look through some of these considerations. First, it's important that you clean up uh, your uh, public key that exists in the instance, especially if you want to share that instance with somebody else. Uh, it's like giving somebody uh, access to your house for a weekend, but also keeping a key, or <laughs> maybe not the best uh, analogy, but the idea is that if you don't clean up your authorized keys, uh, they will use that VM to start instances, their public key is going to be added, appended to the authorized, okay? So they will have access with their private key. You will also have access unless they look and they clean up your, uh, your key in there, okay? So it's polite. If you know that you'll be sharing it, don't leave your accesses in there. And how you do that? Basically, you remove the uh, authorized keys file where your public key is uh, added. Also, it's important to clean up any confidential data that you might have saved in the instance. Like uh, we talked about, about yesterday, how you uh, set up an application properties files that's going to be used by your storage client to download data. That file, uh, if you are DACO approved, is going to have your token. Your token is confidential. Very important not to leave this uh, file in there with the token. Uh, or you might download data from a Genos site, which is another uh, protected data repository. Also uses token-based authentication, the same concept. Maybe you download data from Amazon S3, you have a file containing your credentials, clean it up. So anything that um, is confidential shouldn't be in the snapshot. Not only that you you might share it later with somebody else, but also you forget that you put your credentials in there and uh, it's better not to, to leave them in there in the first uh, place. Also, it's a good practice to clean up your uh, bash history. Uh, if somebody starts an instance from a snapshot that you shared with them, if they look in the bash history, they might say comments that you run. Uh, some comments uh, take uh, credentials as part of the command. So the bash history is going to show. <laughs> so you think that you deleted your credentials, you are safe, but they just look, they run history to see something they run uh, in their history and they see, oh, look, whoever gave me this, actually I see his password that he used or his token or. So clean up your bash history by uh, removing the um, home directories that bash history file or also history dash C resets the current bash sessions history. Okay? Uh, the history is saved in that file when you log out. So if you run three comments and you look in the history file, you will not see them, right? When you log out, they will be written from the memory to that file. So it's important that remove the file and also uh, unset your history before you log out. Keep the image size small. As I said, um, when you um, save data on the image, okay, uh, the disk of the image balloons. We use QCOW2 uh, file format for the image. So if we have a computer that has uh, five Ubuntu uh, instances running, okay, we only have one base image for Ubuntu 16.04 and the five VMs 
um, have disks, virtual disks, that use the base image as a as a read-only uh, base image, basically. And whatever changes the users make into their disks are captured in a file that keeps growing. Okay. So if you start uh, five instances that are uh, scheduled to run on a compute node, that compute node is going to have one, let's say, 300 or 10 gigabyte uh, Ubuntu disk and five smaller files. If you download data from the internet, your small file, which is which captures the changes in your virtual disk, is going to start growing. Okay, so it's going to balloon basically. Uh, even if you then delete those files, okay, it doesn't shrink back. Okay, so it is as large as it was able to to grow by you downloading data and expanding its uh, its usage. So it's important. Uh, you start an instance, you download the data, you do an analysis, you are happy with it, and then uh, you not necessarily take a snapshot. You could start the second instance, just install your application that you know that it's working now, but don't also download <laughs> the data, okay? Because even if you delete it, that snapshot is gonna be larger than it could have been if you just put your uh, application in the first place. Um, very important, plan plan your uh, image um, usage. So try to think, okay, what I'm going to do? I have this instance, I customized it, uh, I cleaned up my bash history, I removed my credentials, everything uh, is good. Um, how am I going to use it? Am I going to start one instance and repeat the process with that one? Am I going to do 50 at a time? Um, what's going to happen? So probably you'll need some data on addition of to the binaries that you have uh, and the application that you will have in that instance. So it's usually good to uh, keep your reference data uh, separate from the instance. Okay. Um, you can start an instance in your cloud environment just to provide the reference data, uh, install a web server or an FTP server, download your data there, and as your instances start, they will go and pull the data locally in the same cloud very fast. Instead of going to 1000 Genomes FTP server or somewhere outside uh, over the internet where you will have to share access to that site with users all over the world, you'll have your dedicated uh, reference data local in your environment without having to replicate it 50 times. Only when you use it, uh, you, you'll uh, have it available. So one way to do that is execute a script that um, downloads the data from the FTP server, does uh, security updates, other pre-configuration um, steps. So proper planning will save you, as I said, uh, time later. Uh, your instances will start faster and you'll, you'll spend more time uh, doing the analysis instead of waiting for them to, to be ready. And also uh, there is a cost uh, component that's uh, involved here, especially in the public cloud the providers where everything is uh, charged. Um, this is a snapshot. We'll go in the lab on how you take a snapshot. The idea is that um, it's pretty simple. It's just one step. You click a button and you uh, give it a name. The name should be descriptive so later on you know, um, like you can say snapshot before installing whatever or snapshot with fully deployed uh, workflow and maybe a date, a version, it's up to you how to uh, organize your um, images. If the snapshot is gonna be larger, it's gonna also take longer for it to be uploaded to the central repository, okay? So your VM runs on compute number 14, as I said, and uh, now when you take the snapshot, you'll have a few gigabytes or 
whatever size the uh, snapshot is, have to be uploaded to the central repository. Okay? If you had a lot of data in there, even if you deleted it, it's going to take a while for the entire ballooned root disk to uh, be uploaded. So you'll see um, in the dashboard, in the web UI, uh, multiple stages for that operation. It's going to be snapshotting, and then queuing, and then saving. Okay. Uh, when the snapshot is taken, the VM is suspended, okay? which means that you won't have access to it anymore over SSH. Okay? Um, also, if you remove the SSH key, as it's recommended, if the snapshot doesn't happen fast enough for the SSH session to re-establish, okay, the SSH session is going to be totally terminated, which means you'll have to initiate the SSH session back. When you do that, your VM is not going to recognize you anymore because it doesn't have a public key, so you'll be locked out. <laughs> okay, but no worries. The snapshot is there. You can start from the snapshot of a, a new virtual machine. Okay. Uh, so you might as well, after the snapshot is finished, terminate the old instance because it's unusable uh, as it is. Sharing the new image with another tenant project is a um, very uh, useful use case of uh, taking snapshots. Not only it allows you to uh, um, start um, in the future from the same point in time, but also it allows you to Take a, a virtual machine, customize it, make sure it works, be happy with it, and then um, you have another researcher, but it's not in the same project as you in, uh, in OpenStack, but you know that they have an account, let's say, a collaboratory. So you are from McGill, and you collaborate with somebody from UBC, and they tell you that, yes, we are having an account at collaboratory. Okay, uh, can I see the image that you created that has your software and you're happy with it and so on. And basically you take a snapshot and I will show you in the lab how you uh, share that image with them and they will see that image in dashboard and they'll be able to start instances based on your snapshot. Uh, the snapshot and sharing methodology was used mostly before Docker containers came around. So with Dockers you can easier share a uh, Docker container than uh, uh, a full VM uh, snapshot. But there are use cases for both of them. Uh, sometimes uh, creating a Docker container for a complex application that has multiple dependencies, like it's a database with a web server and multiple things, you are going to have a fat container, that's what it's called. <laughs> so it's a, it's a container that you installed a lot of things in, so it's still a big uh, container, and um, for different reasons, uh, you might choose to use a VM to do all this customization and then snapshot it and use it. Plus, uh, the image repository allows you to download your image outside of the cloud. Okay, so let's say uh, McGill has its own OpenStack base but you did your work at, uh, in Collaboratory, you can go and download the image or the snapshot you created, okay? And then if your admins at McGill allow you, you could upload it there, okay? Or you can go to a cloud provider in Europe that has OpenStack and you upload it there. So it allows you to basically move uh, images between uh, OpenStack clouds Sometimes it even other types of clouds. Like you download the image, is a KVM image, but can be uh, converted into a other hypervisors uh, image. So, uh, so this is an example uh, on the slide. Basically, you have a tenant A that has two users, John and Mary. Like many people here, uh, all of them actually are in the same project or tenant, so you see each other's instances, okay? So it's easy for Joel to share uh, an image with uh, Veronica because they see each other's images. Take a snapshot and says, hey Veronica, can you please open a virtual machine or start a virtual machine from that snapshot I took? But what if Joel wants to share this image with George? George is another project, okay? 
So he has to basically, uh, unfortunately, the functionality is not uh, presented in dashboard yet. So it's not easy to just go to dashboard and say share this with. You have to uh, install uh, the Glance client. Glance is the project, the OpenStack project in charge with uh, image repository. Uh, it, it's pretty simple doing the lab. So you install the, the client. You have to have ready your uh, credentials. You need my project ID and you need your snapshot ID. So you need to know what to share with who to share. And run a command and then I will see in my uh, dashboard in the images shared with me, I will see the image that Joel shared. And it's pretty straightforward. Once you uh, do it once, it's not uh, too complicated. Uh, and then it's going to the images, I can find the snapshot and launch from there. Um, another important thing is uh, when you start the VM that you are going to snapshot, start with the smaller uh, flavor that allows you to install your application. Okay, why? Because if you start with a, uh, let's say, C1 medium image, and you take a snapshot, and then I want to, from that snapshot, start an image that's smaller, like C1 micro, okay? It's not gonna fit. And I'm gonna get this message, I'm not sure if you can see in the slide, where it says uh, that, uh, this flavor disk is smaller, it doesn't fit, okay? So it's always good to uh, start with the smallest image size or flavor that allows you to uh, the space needed to customize your your application and uh, make your changes and that instance uh, to, to snapshot it um, now let's look at uh, a scale out planning exercise okay I, I told you that we are going to look how uh, a researcher that uh, did an analysis on one or two samples, he's happy with the results, but now to get meaningful results, he needs to apply the same uh, methodology over 100 samples, okay? And um, the example says, so you perform, let's say, VCF, uh, and you have to do it on 100 samples, but uh, it takes 24 hours on a VM with four cores and 16 gigs of RAM, okay? These are your average uh, run times. Um, but for this project, you only received enough money to run at the current uh, prices of the provider 100 cores for 72 hours. Let's say it costs 10 cents a, uh, an hour uh, per core, and you have this is the budget. So you calculate, okay, so if I run, uh, I need uh, 100 cores. 72 hours, I'm gonna run out of the of money. Also, you have a, a quota, okay? You say, okay, I'm gonna use all the money in first day and uh, I'm gonna finish right away. It's not exactly like that because you also have a quota in, at least in uh, smaller environments. In Amazon, probably you can go and say, I have $10,000, I wanna spend them all today. Yes, we have capacity to do that. Okay, but even there, if you say I have $10 million and I want to spend them all today, give me all the CPU, they will say, well, we don't have $10 million worth of CPU capacity just for you. So there are quotas everywhere. For this exercise, we assume that you have a quota of 100 cores, so you cannot uh, use more than that in a day. And also the samples that you have uh, have different sizes. Most of them are around 180 gigabytes, okay? Which is an average size for um, uh, a line band, let's say. Uh, problem is that 15 of these, uh, 100, actually have higher coverage or uh, more complex mutations and uh, take 310 gigabytes of disk space. So you won't be able to use the same flavor for uh, all the um, uh, VMs. So you have to basically do some math to see, okay, how can I do this? So these are the flavors that your uh, cloud provider offers, okay? 
So we are looking at the C1 medium that has four cores and enough disk for most of your uh, samples, okay? And uh, for uh, the last 15 samples, you need probably C1 Jumbo, which is eight cores and gives you 320 gigs of disk, okay? So you don't wanna go uh, with a too large instance. It's gonna cost you and more and you don't need the, the extra space like uh, C1 extra large that has 400 gigabytes, 12 cores. It costs more, of course. So uh, what you can do is, uh, actually I have this set up. I'm gonna show you if you have them after the, you complete your lab. Have uh, a simple Python web server that uh, when you uh, do an HTTP request on a specific path like sample small, uh, is gonna give you back uh, the UID of the average sized uh, samples. Okay, it's like a scheduler. It allows you your VMs to receive the sample ID they have to work with without you having to stay there and give them the work. Okay, this allows you to script it. So if a VM finishes at 2 a.m. and you are not there to give it more work, it's gonna take by itself. Okay, so it allows. Uh, hands off um, automation. So what you can do is you start 49 VMs with C1 small. Um, so this is four cores in the slide. Okay, so um, no, sorry, two cores. So 49 VMs is going to use 98 cores. Okay, so you almost use your quota for a day, and then you use something like Ansible or uh, you can use, we'll see a uh, cloud init script that tells the VM what to do. As the VM starts, uh, it's gonna install its packages or maybe it's a snapshot that already has your application installed, preferably. And then it's gonna visit this website where you have the Python server and it's gonna do a get request on that URL and it's gonna receive back a sample ID. With the sample ID, it's gonna run a download it's gonna download the sample ID, and then it's gonna then run your workflow, and then it's gonna upload the result somewhere, and then it's gonna do a post request saying, hey, I'm done. So the scheduler is going to record that that sample was analyzed. After 24 hours, basically you have 49 samples completed, okay? And in the first day, you basically used less than 100 cores, which was your quota. The second day, you have um, you start 34 more uh, M1 flavor, uh, uh, C1 small flavor, okay, uh, and that uses 68 uh, cores, and then you start C1 Jumbo, which gives you uh, enough space to analyze the large samples. At the end of day two, basically you have 83 average samples analyzed and four of the large ones. Okay, again, you used uh, most of your quota. 32 cores plus uh, 68, that's exactly 100. You are in day three, you only have a few samples left. Okay, uh, you repeat the same process, but you use just two C1 small images uh, to finish the small samples, and then uh, you start 11 Jumbo uh, flavored uh, instances to complete your uh, analysis. So at the end of day three, you basically have uh, finished your samples and uh, you still have some budget left in case you have to rerun some of them that fail for different reasons. And um, you basically have uh, your goal uh, achieved. Uh, but again, you had to go through this planning exercise Okay, uh, to, to, and you need this uh, scheduling um, um, tool that allows you to get UIDs automatically. Of course, you can also manually start 40 VMs and based on the instance type, give them UIDs of the small samples, but 
that would be uh, more time consuming and prone to errors. And uh, so it's important again to pick the right uh, flavor for the job. Okay. Uh, you could just say, ah, I'm going to just go with the largest one. Okay. Well, the largest one is going to uh, use your CPU quota faster and uh, it's going to cost more and you don't need the largest one for the small uh, small VMs, for the small samples, okay? Another important thing, start small, okay? And increase your VM fleet slowly. Uh, if, especially in the phase where you uh, fine tune your uh, methodology or procedure, you just start, okay, I'm gonna start 48 instances, okay? Well, what if you have a problem with your instance, it doesn't work, you have to shut down, start again. If you do this in uh, Amazon or in OpenStack somewhere where you are charged uh, by the hour, you'll see that in three hours of testing, you wasted a full day of uh, budget. <laughs> okay, so start small as you gain uh, more confidence in uh, the process, um, ramp up. Mistakes, as I said, can be costly. Um, if you start an instance and delete it 10 times in an hour, it's gonna be 10 hours. And you can do this more than times in an hour. You can do this every minute. And the cloud provider is gonna be happy to charge you for every time you start and stop an instance. So, uh, monitoring is something that is very, very important. Uh, and it shouldn't be done, uh, in my opinion, after you deploy your application and your uh, workflows. Think of monitoring uh, from the beginning. Um, you have to monitor the process and what the instances are doing and be ready to rerun analysis that are stuck. They can be stuck for many reasons. Maybe you download data from uh, an external site which is um, not always available. Uh, so like we did for a Peacock, you start instances, they download from Europe, uh, connectivity is not too good, maybe the Europe site, uh, European site is uh, not always available and it's stuck in download, it downloads for six hours and stays there instead of finishing the downloading and continuing with the analysis, stays there. If you leave it like that, you don't look at it for a week, well, you wasted a week of time and you wasted off week of CPU allocated to a VM that does nothing, okay? So very important to have monitoring. And if you don't plan your monitoring at the beginning, it's gonna be harder to do it with the VMs running. And uh, it's important also to um, think what metrics will be useful to have and to, to track. Uh, maybe uh, you have your workflow uh, set uh, after it finishes every chromosome, uh, update the file saying the status chromosome one is done, or uh, maybe you have some checkpoints in your application that says state where it was, or um, and those metrics should be probably made available outside of the VM, so you don't have to go to each VM to collect them. The VMs can push this metric to an external uh, web server and you just go there and you see them aggregated, okay? So, uh, especially with large-scale analysis where you know that the process is gonna be long, okay? Just uh, rushing into it is actually gonna cost you more time um, as you progress. Because, ah, I didn't think I need this, I didn't uh, consider this now. So, planning as everything, especially for longer projects is, is very important. Uh, my recommendation from the experience with um, the ICGC PICO project, uh, use the loosely coupled uh, monitoring systems that scale well. Okay? So um, don't use uh, an agent-based monitoring where you have a server that has to go to each client to pull the data. Okay? Because you don't know the client's IP addresses, the clients are dynamic, they start and they terminate it and if you have to go to the server and to make configuration changes every time a new client has to be provisioned, that's gonna be a lot of work for you. 
What you want is a new generation of monitoring system like Sensu and there are others that basically the VM, uh, the clients have a small agent installed, but the agent is only configured with the IP address of the server. And they go and they check uh, RabbitMQ, okay? It's a messaging queue application to see what they have to do, okay? By themselves, you don't have to, to tell them to do that. As they start, they just go there and they see, I have to run this script locally to uh, check for free memory and report back. Okay, so the sensor server is going to see a, a new uh, clients showing up in its dashboard and as they are terminated, they will stop reporting. Okay, and you can clean up those that are idle because the VMs might not be there anymore. So, uh, and there are other solutions uh, based on the same design uh, pattern. Basically, they are called loosely coupled, it's a, a pool based. Okay. No, sorry, push-based, okay? So the clients push the data to the server. It's not the other way around, okay? Um, as basically uh, you come into the class, you check in. I don't have to ask everybody if they check in. Uh, another good recommendation is to minimize external dependencies. If your workflow needs reference data, uh, don't use uh, an external reference data server which might be there, but uh, might be uh, a bottleneck or might not be available. You don't want to be slowed down or have your uh, analysis interrupted for uh, external uh, causes. So it's easy to uh, set up your own uh, server that has the dependencies. Um, also, if um, your application needs a uh, package from a repository to install, okay? That uh, package repository might not be available all the time. Like as we are doing um, PCOG analysis, large scale, sometimes Java repositories were not available and that would uh, fail the provisioning process of the application. So you have VMs that are up and running, but we couldn't continue uh, installation of the application because a Ubuntu server or a, a Java repository, whatever, was not available. And uh, it's uh, complicated to go back and to restart the configuration, and you don't want. It's better probably to start an instance, configure it once, you know it's working, everything is there, it's installed, take a snapshot and use that one. Failure domains. Um, as I said, in cloud environments, it's different than corporate IT, where uh, a lot of money is spent in making things um, uh, very uh, reliable in terms of um, um, hardware failure. Okay? Uh, it's a different design pattern. Basically, f failure, as I said, at scale, it, it, it's a fact of life going to happen and uh, as you scale um, spending the money to make everything uh, fail proof knowing that you'll still have failure it's just that now you spend uh, a lot of money trying to avoid it uh, it's not uh, a good um, good tactic so it's better to have uh, your workflows uh, run locally and not rely on uh, on each other and if you have a failure in one of them, okay, I'm just gonna reschedule those that failed. Nothing else is affected. I can still progress. Um, so small uh, failure domains is uh, the way to go in uh, environments where you can necessarily control uh, the physical infrastructure. You are not the only tenant. You share those resources with other um, projects, other companies, maybe other researchers. Uh, that sometimes can run very intensive uh, workflows that will affect your own. And uh, I think uh, I finished my slides. I will uh, have any questions. No questions? Christian. So say after doing all the analysis, I am done. I'm 
this log out of all instances turned in. This data I'm saying. You can either um, create a volume, okay, and save your data on the volume, and that volume is going to uh, survive your instance termination, okay. But again, it doesn't really scale. If you have 50 instances, you have to have create 50 volumes, each of them, and then you have 50 volumes left after you terminate the 50 instances, okay. A better way is to, uh, and we'll see in, uh, in the lab, uh, I'll do a demo, where the instance, uh, when it finishes, it copies the results of the analysis to an S3 uh, bucket, where it's like a, an object storage, okay? And that is available over uh, the internet from anywhere. And uh, So as a collaboratory user, can I ask to have an S3? Yeah, you have. Yeah, and uh, I will actually show an example in the lab where uh, I start 10 instances, each of them takes uh, its own UID, does the BAM stats, and then uploads the data to its own uh, bucket. And uh, I will see the buckets being <laughs> created and populated with the results. Um, and then I turn at the instances, but the results are safe. Another good recommendation, save the results of the workflow as soon as the workflow is finished. There is no guarantee that uh, it's going to be there later. and why would you keep it uh, locally? Like, uh, don't do five workflows on that instance and say, I'm going to upload when all five are done. Do them, uh, upload them as soon as they, they finish. You know, put them in a safe place. Uh, and then if something happens, you didn't lose uh, more than one uh, in progress uh, workflow. Uh, 